Дамы и господа, это Привейл и ваш ведущий Грег Оли. I'm Greg Oliar. This is Prevail. Welcome to the show. We've got a great show. Victor Rudd is here. When I was brainstorming people that I wanted to have on my podcast, when I decided that I was going to have a podcast, one of the first names on the list, if not the first name, was Victor Rudd. And the reason why is because he taught me something that has crystallized my understanding of Ukraine. And Ukraine is so important in understanding what's going on right now in Russia, in the United States, and in geopolitics in general. Once you understand the Ukraine piece, everything falls into place and you you know, wake up like, oh my God, now it makes sense. I see the error of our ways. I see what Russia's trying to do. All of it makes sense and holds. I was introduced to Victor because he started reading my stuff and communicated with me, which seems amazing to me that he's reading my stuff. He is an expert on Ukraine. He was the chairman of the Board of Governors of the Ukrainian American Bar Association, the chairman on the Committee of International Affairs and Foreign Policy. He did his undergraduate work at Harvard. He went to Duke Law School. He's been studying this stuff for a long, long time. And he writes a lot. He writes in a lot of different publications, and he corresponds with a lot of people, which we're going to talk about at the beginning of the interview. And... I read a piece that he wrote back in uh, 2014, in March of 2014, called Russia's War on Ukraine. This is on the Accuracy and Media website. I think, I think it appears somewhere else too, but that's where I have the copy that's, that's right in front of my face right now. And it goes into the history of Ukraine and Russia. And I read this thing and my mind was blown. It really was. Similar to last week, how Jameson Firestone came onto the show and kind of blew my mind. Victor Rudd's work blew my mind. So I'm eager for you guys to listen to what he has to say, and it will help crystallize the situation with Ukraine and Russia. It just will. It did for me. I'm, I'm super excited to have him on the show this week. Is there anything else going on this week that I feel the need to hit here up front? No. Republicans are bad. The Republican lawmakers are gaslighting us. They want us to think that The January 6th insurrection, the besieging of the Capitol was just a bunch of tourists, you know, like like the Nazi tourists went to Poland and the Japanese tourists went to Hawaii in 1941. (sighs) That isn't my joke. Somebody else made that that joke. It's not even a joke. I I can't believe we're, we're trying to make light of this. It's more an ironical statement, but. That's what we're dealing with, with the Republicans. I can't handle it anymore. I'm, I'm sick of thinking about it. So we're going to think about something else. We're going to turn our attention outside the United States, halfway around the world, to the dead center of Europe, to Ukraine. And we'll be right back with Victor Rudd. Do you remember your first contact with a Russian handler? The thrill of clandestine meeting in the Bethesda Cheesecake Factory. The pride in helping make a great America again. Hi, I'm Simona Mangiante. You know, 2016 was such a great year for engagement with Russia. That's why Time in Life with Books presents a remarkable new series, Traitors. This 101 volume collection features all your most revered Russia engagers. Mike Flynn, Roger Stone, Jared Kushner, Mike Pence, and my husband, George Papadopoulos. Traitors is yours for just three monthly payments of $19.99. We prefer Bitcoin, but also accept Dogecoin, Eternium, NFT, and whatever stocks Elon Musk say to buy. Call 1-800-C-O-L-L-U-D-E. Operatives are standing by. That's 1-800-C-O-L-L-U-D-E. Call in next 10 minutes and you also receive autographed, prison-worn Paul Manafort jumpsuit and fake Italian bride. 
And now, Bic to prevail. All right, my guest today is someone I've wanted to have on the show since I conceived of the idea of having a podcast. His name is Victor Rudd. He was the chairman of the Board of Governors of the Ukrainian American Bar Association, the chairman of the Committee on International Affairs and Foreign Policy, and the chair and foreign policy advisor for the Ukrainian National Association. Victor, how are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Thanks for coming on. I, I, I thought we'd start, this is your suggestion, with I'm going to read the opening part of a letter that you wrote to the incoming, not yet confirmed Secretary of State. In anticipation of your upcoming confirmation hearings as Secretary of State, I'm writing concerning the ongoing developments in Ukraine. Even though Ukraine is the largest European country, the size of Germany, England, and Hungary combined, it has been forever a terra incognita for Americans, citizens, and policymakers alike. That, together with Ukraine's sudden and stunning appearance on the international scene, requires a studied reassessment of America's mindset about, quote, Russia, unquote, that has dominated for now almost a century. This is especially so because, regardless of the result of the upcoming elections in Ukraine, the U.S. will be confronted by ever-increasing and sophisticated attempts by Russia to suborn that country. Putin's soul is of an unrepentant Czechist. Okay, that's the beginning of the second paragraph. Now, what's amazing about this letter is that you did not write it to Anthony Blinken. You wrote it to Condi Rice in December of 2004. That's correct. So <laughs> you're definitely um, prescient with this. And I wanted to have you on because I agree with your assessment that the history of Ukraine is not something that most Americans know about. I really didn't know about it until I read some of your work and it opened up my eyes a lot. I want to start off uh, and just go through and, and, and talk about it. You know, first, there's the, the fun facts about Ukraine, which, as you say in the piece, the largest, it's the largest country in Europe in terms of size. And I was reading in one of your pieces, you said, well, it's directly in the center of Europe on a map. And I thought, no, it's not. That can't be right. And then I looked at a map and yeah, there it is. It's right in the middle. Kiev's almost smack dab in the middle of Europe, even though we don't think of it that way because Western Europe is so outsized in our, in our imagination. So what are some other things that you think most Americans don't know about? Just, you know, quick facts and stuff like that about Ukraine. Well, um, Ukraine is actually a territory. This is a characterization given to it by uh, Professor Norman Davies uh, from Oxford. It's the territory that saw the migration of the greatest numbers of humanity from the east to the west, passing through what is now Ukraine to settle Europe, the current countries that we know, the settlements, the, the human population of Europe, west of Ukraine, passed through Ukraine. It was an eastward migration. That was, of course, many, many moons ago. Uh, much more currently, uh, Ukraine is one of the oldest uh, democratic countries in Europe with a democratic uh, tradition. It established a constitution that could have been a model for the U.S. Constitution 77 years later with representative government, a balance of power, three branches of government, sanctity of uh, contracts, separation of church and state. Uh, so it has that uh, tradition and that distinction, actually, we'll talk about a little later on, perhaps, <clears throat> in terms of Russia, because Russia is a very vertical-oriented society. There is no uh, civil society to speak of, either horizontally or to intersperse between the population and, and the government. Ukrainians are very, very uh, civil-minded, distrust of authority, um, bouncing around a little bit, of course. Ukraine was pivotal to the... Um, well, actually, a little uh, uh, fun fact, actually, uh, because otherwise I'll get a little bit too much into the politics. Uh, people may not be aware, but the Ottoman Empire invaded Europe, got as far as the siege of Vienna in the late 1600s. And that's as far as Islam was able to penetrate Europe. And that siege was broken in large measure thanks to a Ukrainian called Yuri Kulchitsky, who uh, fought against the Turks, knew the mentality, knew the language. I'm not going to get into the details, but the long and the short of it is, uh, he was rewarded by uh, the Viennese at the time, 
and opened up a coffee house, introduced coffee to Europe. <laughs> because he spent a lot of years in Turkey drinking Turkish coffee, and he introduced the novelty of putting a little milk and a little sugar into it. So if you go to Vienna today, you will find a square and a statue to Kulczycki, uh, the savior of Vienna, and uh, with a coffee house there. Uh, he was actually tapped by the Polish king uh, because the Poles had fought the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians had fought the Turks, the Poles knew about that military capacity. So he tapped Kulczycki. Kulczycki went in and the siege of Vienna was broken. And that's as far as Islam got into Europe. And then, of course, more recently in the last hundred years, uh, Ukraine was pivotal, uh, or I should say Russian occupation and control of Ukraine uh, was pivotal in the rehammering of the old Russian empire that fell apart during World War One, rehammered under a new moniker uh, called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Uh, Ukraine was the key republic, and consequently, fast forward to the 90s, late 80s and 90, when Ukraine reasserted its independence, the Soviet Union fell apart. The irony, of course, is that we in the West uh, claimed victory in the Cold War. The Cold War is measured from the day that the Soviet Union dissolved, and nobody really knows and understands why it happened, because Ukraine pulled the string. Uh, and it's even more ironic uh, because uh, our Russian experts always conflated Russia with the USSR. Uh, our policy was never, ever to bring, up, uh, bring about a fall of the Soviet Union. We never wished that. And we always characterized the Soviet Union as Russia. Yeah. It was a monolith. Um, nobody understood that it was really a multinational empire. And uh, when that came to pass, ironically, we... Um, we took credit for it, even though our policies uh, uh, actually uh, really went hand in hand with Russia in helping Russia maintain control of Ukraine throughout the days of the Soviet rule. It's uh, it's a very very unfortunate uh, paradox. Well, I want to get I want to come back to that. So let's now fast forward, not fast forward, rewind back into the past. The first settlement in that's been claimed by what we think of as as russia is the kievan rus and that's not really russia it sounds like russia because it's rus right but kievan rus come from ukraine so talk about that a little bit yeah well you know uh, uh, facially or audibly i guess uh, people sometimes confuse believe it or not australia and austria right because of the similarity of the name and same with uh, kievan rus and and russia uh, that name was appropriated by Peter I in the, uh, in the 1700s. Prior to that, Western Europe knew what today is Russia as Muscovy. That's, that was the terminology that was used. And uh, Russian historiographers in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, decided uh, they wanted to establish a more uh, legitimate, if you will, pedigree and hark back to the days of Kievan Rus, which was actually at the time, the largest political entity in the medieval Europe. It had a lot of Viking uh, background. Uh, it was formed originally as uh, on, a, on a trading path from uh, the Scandinavian countries down into the Black Sea and onward to Byzantium and to Greece. So it was, it, there's a Viking heritage there as well. The Russians uh, misappropriated the name, and I guess the easiest way perhaps to make an analogy is to uh, consider uh, the example I use, for example, is the Roman Empire. Countries today such as Spain, England, Germany, even Israel, which were part of the Roman Empire, you would never consider that Rome was the beginning of Romanian history or Israeli history or Spanish history just because it was under Romanian control. So the analogy would be the Roman Empire and the Kievan Rus state and uh, an outlying colony or, uh, such as Russia then claiming uh, its origins and dominion over what is now Ukraine uh, and, and Kiev. It's like uh, Romanians calling Italians today little Romanians and uh, Rome as the beginning of Romanian history or Spanish history. Uh, that is a, a typical reality reversal that we see in a lot of uh, uh, Russian uh, historic revisionism and also in a lot of its uh, uh, political uh, disinformation campaigns today. 
It's almost one of the the original Russian disinformation campaign was the erasure uh, of Ukraine and the appropriation of uh, of Ukraine. You talk in one of the articles about that it was such a literate society, talking back at the Kievan Rus, where the princesses would marry the kings and uh, of, of Western Europe, and when Henry the First of France married um, a Ukrainian princess, she signed her name to the document, and he just marked it with an X because he couldn't yeah, write. Yeah, the Kievan Rus state was was very very dis, uh, distinct from other. Uh, medieval political organizations in Europe because uh, it, it was very egalitarian. Education for women was mandatory. The ceremony, uh, the marriage ceremony in the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is unlike any other church, Orthodox or otherwise, there is no obey command on the wife. They are equal partners. There is no such thing as obeying the husband or obeying the wife. That doesn't exist. It's a very egalitarian society. And also a very uh, matriarchal one. Uh, you read about the Amazons, where the Amazons were female warriors in the Scythian age long ago in what is now Ukraine. So that tradition tends to uh, hold over a bit. And then the other thing that's, that I found fascinating is that John Smith, who founded uh, the colony in, uh, in Virginia there, town, was in Ukraine. Before that, I mean, yeah, he was. Uh, if, if you look at the uh, website of the uh, National Park Service in the United States, and they'll talk about Russia, so on and so forth. But very briefly, John Smith uh, was a mercenary fighting uh, against the Ottoman Turks, captured, wounded, uh, put up for sale in the slave market in Crimea, uh, which at that time was still controlled by the indigenous population, the Crimean Tatars, uh, happened to escape, uh, was given refuge in Ukraine, stayed there for about a year, year and a half. Uh, ultimately returned to England, and uh, eventually they wound up uh, in Jamestown in the New World. It's not clear whether the Ukrainian traveled with uh, uh, Captain John Smith uh, on the initial voyage or whether he followed up, but uh, he was certainly here. So Ukrainians have been in the United States for a long time. That's that's also something well, that's, that's pretty critical. Cool. Yeah. So as I understand it, prior to the 16th century, there were no czars of Russia. There were only grand princes of, of Moscow. And Ivan the Terrible was the first to call himself czar of Russia. Probably not a good omen that the guy who founds the institution of being a czar is known as the Terrible. Right. And he, he was pretty terrible. He invented the state secret service. He, he was a bad dude. What happened in that time? How, how did Kiev decline and Moscow rise in, in the you know, historically? Well, uh, the Mongol invasion uh, of uh, that part of the world, uh, it hit uh, what is now Russia and Ukraine both. Uh, Kyiv was totally destroyed by the Mongols in 1240, and uh, sort of the nerve center, administrative center of what then became a declining empire moved to what is now Western Ukraine. The Russians really became, um, I would say, implementers, if you will, and uh, proxies for uh, the Golden Horde. And as long as they provided gold, money, treasure, uh, manpower for, uh, for the Mongol army, uh, they accommodated themselves to the, uh, uh, to the Golden Horde. And Ukraine, uh, what is now Ukraine, became part actually of the Lithuanian Polish Empire. It spent about 500 years uh, without any contact with what is now Russia. So that's also an important distinction because, you know, again, the idea that that has pervaded for all of my life and and certainly all of 20th century U.S. history is that Russia and Ukraine are exactly the same thing and there's slight variance. But no, for 500 years, it's part of uh, something completely different. Let's talk about after the First World War and what happens with the Russian Revolution and how that affected Ukraine. Well, U Ukraine was uh, devastated in the First World War and at the uh, Paris Peace Conference, which led to the Treaty of Versailles, some of the historians in the audience may know what that is. Uh, the Ukrainians warned the West that uh, uh, they, well, they were invaded uh, by that time, reinvaded by, uh, by Russia. And they warned the West that uh, unless uh, Ukraine was aided, that Russia would control Ukraine and uh, with access then to the Black Sea and on into the Middle East. Aid that was promised to Ukraine uh, was, uh, was promised and then denied and actually turned over then by the Allies instead of to Ukraine, turned over to Russia. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Russia conquered Ukraine again and became the key republic. And, uh, you know, after that, again, we had history. I could go into that right now, if you'd like, or a little bit later on. But we had the irony, the precedent being set that uh, the, the, the failure uh, to assist Ukraine at that time was repeated again uh, with the, um, the denuclearization of Ukraine by, uh, by the West, primarily by the United States uh, in 1990, uh, 1994. And uh, after that, we had the, the 30s, we had the forced starvation of Ukraine and the breaking of Ukrainian resistance to Soviet rule. How many people are thought to have died during that? I mean, that was, I, people may not know about this. Stalin yeah. sort of systematically starved Ukrainians, Ukraine being pretty much the breadbasket of that entire region. So yeah, and initially, uh, well, the, number, the, the numbers at the time that the people were talking about, the secret police, the OGPU, and the nomenclature of the Soviet Party members, the numbers that they were talking about uh, at the time was uh, between 7 and upwards even of 14 and 50 million people. And that was astonishing from the standpoint of the fact that talking about that starvation and about people being killed, that was a capital crime. If you mentioned that, you were dead. You were either sent to Siberia or you were executed. And the fact that this was discussed secretly, quietly, uh, by, um, by Soviet party members uh, is very, very telling. This was known in the West. Uh, Walter Duranty from the New York Times was a key player in this. Uh, the New York Times, actually, there is a State Department memo from the U.S. Embassy in Berlin to Washington describing a meeting with Walter Duranty, where he admitted that the New York Times had an agreement with Stalin to only report the news that Stalin wanted reported. Mm -hmm. And since that was the time that uh, uh, FDR wanted to extend diplomatic recognition to the Soviet Union, the news of that starvation was quashed. And we extended uh, diplomatic recognition to Stalin at the time of, uh, at the time of this forced starvation. The, the new uh, research now uh, being done cuts that number drastically. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but the number now of around 4 million is uh, a gross undercounting because it doesn't count Ukrainians who were killed also in Russia. Ukrainian settlements in Russia uh, were uh, blockaded, barricaded, nobody in, nobody out. And consequently, you had about 2 million Ukrainians outside of Russia who were starved as well. It's a long, complica complicated history, sometimes confused with economic privation and the like brought about by collectivization. But in Ukraine, it was a totally different situation. It had to do with uh, what was called Soviet nationality policy uh, toward Ukraine. Well, the idea, as I understand it, was just to basically erase Ukrainian history by erasing the Ukrainians and doing the things that you know strong men do to try to break up what they perceive as being possibly their, their greatest threats. Yeah, the, the predicate to it was really the destruction of the cultural and the intellectual elite of Ukraine. And when that failed, when the resistance still continued and when the rebellions continued, then uh, the, uh, the push was to break the back of the Ukrainian farmer because that's where Ukrainian uh, tradition and national self-awareness was based. It was in the villages, it was in the countryside. Once the elites were eliminated, that didn't work or it didn't work enough then you break, uh, you, you break the back of national resistance. And actually, uh, the Soviet Union did what uh, Moscow did, what it's doing now. They established a faux republic, so-called, based in uh, an eastern city in Ukraine called Kharkiv. That was, for them, the capital city. But once the starvation was stopped, then uh, Stalin had enough uh, self-confidence to move the capital of Ukraine back to its historic place, which was Kiev. He did not dare do that before because he was afraid of stirring national sentiment by uh, organizing the, the, the Soviet state of Ukraine with a capital in Kyiv. So talk a little bit more about uh, Walter Duranty, because I think people listening to this have heard the name before in the context of the New York Times. Sure. I mean, he, he was basically a, a propagandist for Stalin, right? Is that? Yes, he was. He, he, he was actually an Englishman with one leg. Uh, somewhat of a sex object, very interestingly. He, he, uh, and the Soviets used this. He was based in Moscow. Uh, they used this uh, to keep him uh, in line. And he was a very, very unprincipled uh, individual. He was a global correspondent that everybody knew in the United States or outside of the United States. Uh, there was a foil to him 
Uh, Gareth Jones, actually, former secretary to uh, Lloyd George, the former British prime minister who went to Ukraine, reported honestly, his story was spiked, it was killed. And two years later, uh, he was murdered in uh, Mongolia. He went out uh, on a trip out there and all the fingers point to the MKVD, the secret police at that time. So Stalin got his revenge. Mm -hmm. But Walter Durante uh, received a Pulitzer Prize for his accurate and faithful reporting of events in the Soviet Union. And he covered up, uh, he covered up the uh, forced starvation of Ukraine. And in private, we, we, we have this uh, on record in private discussions with uh, other journalists in the West. Uh, he admitted that a minimum 7 million Ukrainians had been starved in Ukraine, maybe upwards of 10 million. Uh, and this comes uh, from uh, his co-journalist, uh, Eugene Lyons, who worked for Uni uh, United Press International in his writings and in his private correspondence. So he was a prime example. And the Columbia uh, School of Journalism actually uses uh, Walter Durante as an example of um, fraudulent uh, newspaper reporting, which in this case sort of amounted to denying the Holocaust that, you know, the Germans uh, are, are not murdering Jews. So that would be the rough analogy of what uh, Durante did back in 32 and 33. Yeah, uh, fake news and somebody that's that that's that highly regarded and well-connected and printed in the Times, especially then before you have TV and, you know, obviously the internet is so influential because who else still listens to it? The precedents are there. People who know that history and, and, and look at what's going on right now, myself mm -hmm. included, of course, you know, there's, there's nothing surprising. It's just a different mechanism, a different modality. Uh, but, you know, occupy the brain. Why occupy territory if you can occupy somebody's brain? Yeah. And that's what it amounts to. Yeah. And the Russians are very good at this. Um, so talk a little bit about World War II and the lead into World War II and the relationship between Hitler and Stalin. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because there's a book that just came out that finally in, in the West is... Um, confirming uh, what uh, a lot of people knew who lived uh, during that war from that part of the world. And that is that, yeah, uh, Hitler had a war. And actually, no, nobody knows this. It's, it, it's stunning for all the movies that we have. But Hitler's purpose for the war in Europe was to uh, conquer and occupy Ukraine. He wanted uh, not only the grain, but he wanted the natural resources, which were easily accessible, they're close to the surface, they're of high quality, so on and so, uh, so, so forth. So the real purpose of uh, the war for Hitler was to uh, gain Ukraine as a prize. The purpose that Stalin had, and if you look at his military formations and, and the thinking at the time, was to actually turn Hitler against the West, to weaken the West, and then Stalin would move in and finish it all off. They, of course, had their infamous pact in 1939 and it worked for a while, and then Hitler turned on Stalin, and Stalin became the ostensible innocent victim. But at the end of the day, after World War II, uh, Stalin controlled more territory, more humanity than Hitler ever did. So the question is, you know, who's the winner of that war? And for the people who were first occupied by the Nazis and then occupied by the Red Army, freedom did not come for them, and the end of World War II did not end until really the Soviet Union fell apart. And Ukraine had, Ukraine had, uh, I'm trying to name, uh, trying to remember the name of uh, uh, the gentleman who wrote in uh, Life Magazine, no, excuse me, Saturday Evening Post, Edgar Snow, I'm sorry, was the journalist for the Saturday Evening Post. And he wrote a fascinating piece at the time saying that Ukraine lost uh, a little bit more than 9 million people, five and a half million civilians, over 2 million, almost 3 million in the Red Army and the rest were uh, forced laborers shipped out to Germany. Many of them were killed. Uh, many of them were captured by the US Army and returned back to the Soviet Union under a program of forced repatriation. We called it Operation Keel Hall. Uh, the British had the same thing called the Operation East Wind. The Ukrainians, uh, the Ukrainian underground had a source in KGB headquarters, or at that time it was the NKVD headquarters in Germany. And they warned Washington that uh, Stalin uh, was going to assassinate General George Patton. That message was intercepted in the office of Donovan, the head of the Overseas uh, Secret Service, OSS, mm -hmm. which was a precursor to the CIA. And uh, his top aide intercepted uh, the warning from the Ukrainians. And uh, instead of doing something about it, the arrest warrant went out from the United States to uh, run down uh, the Ukrainian informers and have them arrested. 
the Americans weren't able to do that, uh, but uh, Moscow was successful in the late 1950s. Uh, they assassinated in Germany uh, two of the informers that uh, gave the Americans the heads up about uh, Stalin's plan for Patton. Yeah, Stalin, I'm, I'm thinking that's, that's fascinating about Patton. I didn't know that. Um, if you look at the numbers of people killed in World War II in battle and stuff, there was a graphic that sort of showed you, you know, that rose up this and that. And Russia or the Soviet Union, I should say, lost more people than anybody else. I mean, they ultimately beat Germany, I guess, but the, the, the losses were just unfathomably large. But it sounds like, and what you say in, in one of the pieces that I read, I mean, Russia itself never was pretty much far removed from where the Nazi army was coming. Most of the war was fought in the out in the outlining uh, provinces, right? Uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and the three Baltic republics were totally overrun by the Nazis. Uh, uh, the Nazis did penetrate part of Russia uh, a little bit uh, past Ukraine to Stalingrad uh, territorially. It, it was not allowed. There was a terrible siege of Leningrad mm -hmm. uh, by the Nazis. And of course, they uh, approached the outskirts of Moscow. But if you look at the amount of territory uh, that was occupied and destroyed by the Nazis in Russia compared to Ukraine or, uh, or the Baltic countries or Belarus, the devastation there was uh, horrendous. Uh, actually, Edgar Snow in this uh, Saturday P Evening Post article in the late 1940s, I to clarify that saying what we call uh, a Russian war was for, uh, first and foremost a Ukrainian war. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's part and parcel, unfortunately, of that mythology that the Soviet Union equals Russia. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is just so terribly, terribly wrong. And unfortunately, there really isn't a single precedent, a single uh, CIA director, national security advisor, secretary of state, not a single one who has not conflated the two, even after, even after the Soviet Union fell apart, right? At which point we should have been aware well, it really was an empire. It was a multinational state. It fell, it fell apart along those lines. So let's stop considering it to be Russia. So what is happening now? Putin is not stupid. He's picked up on it. And he is now quoting American politicians and academics and media personnel saying, well, look, you always call this Russia. Therefore, it's my territory. I'm entitled to it. And it's you know, Ukrainians are Russians, everybody's Russian, so on and so forth. It's a real, real perversion of, uh, of, of, of uh, geographic and historic understanding. It's, 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 it's absolutely stunning. One of the reasons that I wrote my letter to Condoleezza Rice. Well, you have, I mean, I remember when I was, was little, I always used to like maps and I would trace the maps and Russia was always the Soviet Union, right? See, I'm conflating it. It's so big on the map, but they were always like sort of in these lined in, it would be like, Ukraine SSR, Kazakh right. SSR. And I was always like, oh, is that like California and Texas, right. I guess? But it's yeah. not. It's really just these were sovereign places that got overrun and taken over by, by the communists. Yeah, and what makes it worse, you know, the United States, we have a, a state called Georgia. Well, there, there's a Georgia, uh, there was a Georgia in the Soviet Union. So that goes further towards this, uh, uh, you know, simplistic notion that uh, the two are the same. And, and the optics are all wrong to... You know, it's hard for us to conceive. We're neophytes in history and geography, particularly Americans, Westerners generally, but I think particularly Americans. And for us, an empire has to be something that's scattered around the globe with huge bodies of water separated pieces of land someplace, right? And the Soviet Union was never that. It was all conti one contiguous landmass. And consequently, we see that as one continuous country. That was never the case. And that escaped, that escaped our military, our politicians, everything for the duration of the Soviet Union, we never comprehended it. If you go back to April of 1926, the cover of Time magazine, there was a NASA photograph of the Chernobyl explosion. Mm. This is NASA, it takes us to the moon. How did they identify it? Chernobyl, Russia. It's not Chernobyl, Ukraine. It's not even Chernobyl, Soviet Union. It's Chernobyl, Russia. Yeah. That's how bad it got. And that's what stuck in the mental recesses of everybody's mind. And that is one of the reasons why we don't react to Russia's latest invasion of Ukraine in 2014. 
as something as bad as, for example, if Russia invaded France. Right. Well, France is obviously a different country. What right do Russians have invading France, right? Or even Poland. But with Ukraine, there, there's a lot more tolerance because we're still under that notion. Well, somehow it is it's Russia's backyard, so on and so forth. And, and we're not aware of the consequence that had for this or that it has uh, for this um, rules-based international order that we fought two world wars over. Going through the history, everybody got this wrong. Wilson got it wrong and the, that you know, the, the first League of Nations and all that. But I just, I remember it said about League of Nations. Didn't, didn't Lenin try to argue that all of the provinces or the conquered lands were independent countries to kind of get more seats at the at the League of Nations or the UN? Or I'm, I'm trying to remember what he, and they were like, no. Well, actually, uh, you know, it's, it, you, you, you're, you're sort of, you're moving in the right direction. Uh, it, it was Stalin who wanted uh, the Soviet Union to have three votes at the United, in the, at formation of the United Nations. It would be, and ironically enough, Russia would not have a vote. It was the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. It would be Belarus and Ukraine. And Belarus and Ukraine, why? Well, very specifically because it was an acknowledgement that these were the two nations that were the most devastated by the Nazis. That's the argument that he used, you know, trying to appeal to, uh, to the West. Uh, initially, he wanted to have a vote for all the republics. They were by theory, by constitution independent states with the right to have a foreign policy, a military, everything else, so on and so forth. That was just fiction. That, that was just window dressing. But uh, that's right. And, and what you had was the Soviet Union, Moscow, getting three votes at the UN automatically every time because they were, of course, puppet states. Right, right. Um, so we got it wrong. Wilson got it wrong. FDR got it wrong. Condi Rice got it wrong. Fiona Hill, you argue, has gotten it wrong too. Like it seems like even now we're still not understanding what's going on there. Well, yeah, the uh, Fiona Hill just a passing. I, I think she's finally come around. Uh, but it, I, I was stunned to read. Actually, it was in two thousand and four, uh, earlier in the year. Uh, she had an op-ed piece in the uh, New York Times. Uh, she had been asked uh, by Putin and other up-and-coming uh, uh, so-called specialists who were tapped by the. Um, uh, by the uh, Russian Secret Service, because they keep track of who's in academia, who has a political future, what's their trajectory. And she and I, un unwittingly, I mean, this is totally unwitting on her part, uh, but she went uh, to have a meeting with Putin at his dacha with a handful of other Western journalists and came back and wrote an article, uh, let's stop criticizing Putin and let's start helping him. Uh, because she had bought into this whole notion of so-called Chechen terrorism, so on and so forth. Uh, when in fact it was a bloody, a bloody uh, conquest of Chechnya, reconquest of Chechnya by uh, by Russian forces, and um, she really didn't understand that she was being used, she was being manipulated. Uh, and uh, Condi Rice as well. Uh, after uh, Putin became president in two thousand, in January two thousand, at a Stanford uh, conference. Uh, she was asked, well, what does Putin do, have to do in order for us to see whether he's somebody we can deal with? Her answer was, well, it depends on what kind of internal tax reform he, he promotes within Russia. And I was stunned. Uh, Putin, by that time, had already resurrected Stalin. He was celebrating Stalin's birthday and the birthday of the founder of the Soviet secret police, Felix uh, Dzerzhinsky. Mm -hmm. uh, the melody of the Soviet anthem was being revitalized. The Soviet Union was being slowly rebuilt. It was clear where this was going. Uh, you do not take, some, it's, it's analogous to, for example, taking a, a former a Gestapo officer in a remilitarized, reassertive Germany who comes to power, starts worshiping Hitler, and then saying that the most consequential thing that he can do to see, you know, to see if we can do business with him is a, the, tax, the tax code that he promotes. Uh, that's, that's absolute insanity. I was, I was stunned. Um, I, I couldn't believe that, uh, that she, a so-called Russia expert, was still thinking this way. The, the whole history of what Putin represented was being dismissed. And that to me was, that, that just had to call for a response. So I wrote the letter to her. You mentioned the birthdays of the people that are being celebrated. That Felix birthday, his birthday is September 11th. I happen right. to know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
And, um, and, uh, and, and, and I'll add that uh, Putin made it clear. He, he was the first one who got on the phone to Washington to express ostensible condolences. Uh, that, yes. that, that was a very clever and measured move to try to get the United States to work with Russia against what they call terrorism in, in its other manifestations. It happened against after the Boston uh, Marathon bombing as well. He was the very first one on the phone. Well, he's the one that are, that did the the, che- the the apartment bombings in Moscow and blamed right. the, the things on it. So he he knows right. very well how effective, you know, th- this stuff can be. Uh, to, you know, using something that's there and and, and twisting it for his own uh, propaganda use. I mean, this is what the Russians do very well. They're very good at propaganda. That's all they're it's basically their 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 principal export is oil and propaganda. That's all that. You know, that's it, all that it, it, it is. Uh, although, let me just interject here, Greg, for a second. It isn't any extraordinary brilliance or acumen on the part of Russia historically. It's really more a function of our default. Our, uh, they, they, they have an algorithm to exploit the principal attributes and benefits of a democratic representative society, a free speech, a revolving door in politics, a lack of an institutional memory, uh, money, the drive for business, the corruptibility of people for that purpose, uh, a short attention span. You know, our time frame is probably no more than five years backwards and five years forwards. That's it. Uh, when I talk with people and I uh, tell them that in 1997, when we, uh, when President Clinton uh, wanted to have Russia join the G7, become the G8 in 1997 was when Alexander Dugin, uh, what people call uh, Putin's Rasputin, drafted the blueprint for exactly what's happening right now in the West and in the United States. Mm-hmm. Separate England, Great Britain from the e- European Union, have an alliance with Iran against the West, exploit and manufacture internal divisions within Western society, particularly within the United States, and particularly the race car, and uh, exploit the right wing, exploit the left wing. It doesn't matter as long as they're chaos. Uh, We cannot conceive of that as being something that people were serious uh, serious about because you have to take a 20-year view of the future. We don't. We're We're in an impatient nation and we therefore place little credibility on the ability of another country such as Russia to do that. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very unfortunate that uh, the one thing, and I'll, I'll just l- l- allow me to make one point because I think it's very, very important. In any endeavor, we always look for people who have experience, whether it's fixing a computer, fixing your brain, Uh, working on your car, whatever it may be, book learning only takes you so far, but it's experience that you really need. And it's unfortunate that in the foreign policy area, which can be a life and death struggle, uh, we have largely ignored, dismissed, uh, belittled uh, the people, the nations who have dealt with Russians for centuries and have not really seriously given them the attention and listened to the advice that they had to offer. And we decided to go it alone, uh, manufacturing our own experts based on books. And a lot of those books were distorted. And the foundation, as I said, for Russian studies in the United States was the old Russian imperial historiography that was imported to the West by Russian historians after the Russian Revolution. Uh, that is a huge Achilles heel uh, that we suffer from. Yeah, I mean, we we have no attention span and no, not even a future attention span. I mean, remember there were the press in the Beltway press was making such a big deal about how Biden hadn't done a press conference in so many days and he finally did it. And all they wanted to know was, are sure. you going to run for re-election? And it's like, sure. who? What are you talking about? What what difference does that make? I mean, it's it's too far we, in the future. Uh, you know, we we um, with, without knowing the lessons of the past, there are patterns that are repetitive, and they serve as a basis for forward thinking. We have no strategic instinct. We have absolutely none. We we go 
almost day to day in a purely response reaction mode. And, and we give far too much credence to something which comes out of our uh, legal and uh, cultural history as a commercial mercantile nation, which is agreements. If you have a problem, if you have an agreement, then you solve the problem. Why? Because if the agreement isn't complied with, you have an enforcement mechanism, you have the courts, right? That's our thinking. In international affairs and dealing with Russia or China, you can have an agreement. If that agreement is breached, what do you do? Where do you go? What's your enforcement mechanism? We can't transplant and transpose our uh, cultural and societal mores and apply it to a country such as Russia or China. Uh, it's a different planet. You don't deal with them that way. You just don't. You can't. We insist on doing that repetitively because, as I say, we have a revolving door in politics. We have no institutional memory. And we can't capitalize on the lessons of the past. They don't stick with us. That's our difficulty. And all of that makes us very, very easy to exploit and take advantage of. These are, these are glaring weaknesses. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with Victor Rudd. I'm former FBI Assistant Director Frank Figluzzi. Join me on a journey deep inside the world's premier law enforcement agency to decode the mysteries and challenges of today's FBI. In this first-of-a-kind podcast, we'll sit down with active duty FBI personnel who reveal their mission, their cases, and their lives. The commonalities that we're looking at with the Highway Serial Killings Initiative are dealing with the long haul trucking industry. These offenders, as they plan, prepare, and consider for their attack, don't do that in a vacuum. Even if they end up alone at the end, that doesn't mean they started off alone. The pattern of this bedspread, what stores it would have been sold at, an outlet club, tips that lead us to possibly identifying that victim. Let's go inside the Bureau with Frank Figluzzi. We're back with Victor Rudd. Now, we spent the first part of the show talking about uh, Ukraine's past. I want to talk a little bit about the recent past and the future. The House Democrats had the ability to impeach Donald Trump because of the Mueller report, specifically book two, the obstruction. Mueller thought they would do it. They didn't. They allowed Bill Barr to neutralize the thing and were hoping that he would just be voted out. What did get them to impeach Trump was what happened in Ukraine. So what, what's your take on, on, on what's happening in there now? Like, who is Zelensky any good? What's 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 your take on that? Well, you know, it's it, it's an ongoing um, it, it's an ongoing puzzle. He seems to have, um, I mean, he, he talked a good game, and then he started. Uh, my prediction was that uh, that was all for show that he would backslide, and uh, that the Russian influence uh, would remain and become stronger, and it did. And yet, interestingly enough, more recently and partially, maybe this is speculation on my part. Partially, it may be that he got a talking to by uh, Secretary Blinken uh, uh, when he was there. Uh, I think that uh, if I can just expand a little bit on your question, I think one thing that would be helpful for, uh, for your audience, though, is to consider the anomaly of, you know, the popular notion of Ukraine generally has been, if anything, uh, chicken Kiev as a frozen dinner in the frozen food aisle of your supermarket, Okay. And all of a sudden, you have Ukraine in only the third impeachment of a U.S. president and the only one on foreign policy. And all of a sudden, Ukraine becomes a word, a household word. Well, how could that have happened without me as a regular guy on the street, a pedestrian watching Monday Night Football and all that? How could all of that have happened all that abruptly? And ultimately, at the end of the day, what is as, at stake here? I mean, we have a lot of issues. We have China, we've got the pandemic, we have, uh, you know, Lord knows now we've got the colonial pipeline, we have solar wind. Yeah, why did that happen, right? But I think what's important to take out of the impeachment hearings and why Ukraine found itself on the map is because 
Ukraine is not only important for itself and what it means to Russia and Russia as an adversary, and I, I'm, I'm not even going to uh, restrict myself to that term. Russia is an enemy, and so is China. I'm going to be point blank about it. I'm not going to beat around the bush. They declare, uh, declare us as that, and we have to understand it, and I don't think sugarcoat the terminology. Ukraine is critical because it is the pivot point for what is already happening, which is the destruction of everything we fought for in two world wars in the last century. It's the rules-based international order. It's the sanctity of borders, territorial integrity, national security. You can't go out and beat the hell out of a neighbor and move into his house and uh, steal his wife, all right? You, you don't do that. And if we don't stand our ground, our ground for ourselves, then you know there's a multiplier effect. China is looking at this. North Korea is looking at this. Freedom of the seas, navigation, territorial waters, and all that. That's on its way out. That's been grossly violated. We haven't enforced it. And uh, I predict that quite possibly by the end of this year, I predict that Russia is going to be asserting territorial claims against the United States in the waters off of Alaska. Mm -hmm. I see that happening. Uh, but in any event, I went a little bit afield from um, you know your your discussion about uh, the impeachment and everything else, but I, uh, I I don't know what questions you're going to be asking further. So <laughs> no, no, I, I, I I'm happy that, for you to talk. I, I that's uh, that's that's the real real essence of it, and it sounds vague. It sounds it sounds amorphous. Sounds theoretical, but it's not. And consider the following scenario: We have traffic rules. We obey them in our own self interest, right? If you run a light, make a turn, you know what's going to happen to that intersection in about 30 nanoseconds. But even with traffic rules, we've got the cops and we have the courts. There's an enforcement power that will force us to comply and to stay on the road and stop at a red light. You don't have that in international affairs. It's a very tenuous and a very tissue thin system. And if people and if countries do not stand by a recognition of their self-interest that you can't go out and invade another country. We went through war because of Iraq invading Kuwait. Absolutely. Right? right. Now, what do we do if Germany invades Denmark? What if Germany invades France? Do you think we would tolerate that for now eight years? No, all hell would break loose and it should, right? Yeah. Well, with, with Ukraine, it didn't. One of the reasons I suggested to you is because people still don't have their head around the fact that Ukraine is not Russia. It is very, very distinct. But the fact that we have not undertaken measures, uh, at least in the sanction area, as strongly as we should have, has sent a very, very clear message to Putin. Uh, those sanctions, you know, by the numbers, maybe they're hurting him, but they're not affecting his conduct. He is just as aggressive and even more so than before. But worse is North Korea, Iran, China, the Middle East. Uh, what do you think China, for example, is thinking uh, about crossing the Formosa Straits and invading Taiwan? Well, Russia invaded Ukraine. That worked for them so far, at least a bit. Uh, what are we going to do? We, we, can't, we can't be provocative in the sense that China and tyrants and totalitarian states and Russia think of as being provocative. And that is not what we think of. When we think about being provocative, we think about threats, arms, screaming and yelling. Russia sees us being provocative because we're feckless. Our pusillanimity, our passivity, is what provokes tyrants, such as Putin, such as the Chinese and others. There's somebody on Twitter today, one of, one of my Twitter followers shared a quote from Winston Churchill which I'm going to butcher, but it's an appeaser is someone who feeds the crocodile thinking that it will eat him last. Right. That's a famous, absolutely. That it is a well-known uh, quote of uh, <laughs> He's got a lot of them, but you mentioned the, the first Gulf War. And I think when you look at that now in uh, with space between um, it, you know, at the time, I don't know what, how I felt about it, but there was, as you said, there was a, a, a a dictatorial tyrant ruling this country. He was a thief, 
The reason he invaded Kuwait was because he didn't want to pay back the loan that they gave him. The first thing he did when he got there was rob the bank. And HW said, no, this, this aggression will not stand, rallied up uh, the allied forces, kicked his ass out. And then, and that was it, you know, and he didn't try to invade anymore. That, that, you know, he was a, not a great person on the, on the world stage, but his territorial ambitions stopped uh, that day. So you contrast that with what's happened in the Crimea, where Putin goes in. Putin is a thief. We know this. He just wants these places for money and uh, everything else. He's just trying to, to boost money. And that's that's his whole MO. Goes in there and nothing happens. I mean, what, what do we expect him to do? We expect him to just be like, okay, I'm I'm good now. It it it's it's irrational to expect that he won't keep going. Greg, here's here, here's the kicker. Um and and this is what really is the multiplier. And and it's a it's a deadly one. Uh after the Soviet Union fell apart, Ukraine became the successor to the third largest nuclear arsenal on the planet. It was larger than China's, France's, and the United Kingdom's combined. The only people, the only countries that had a larger nuclear arsenal was Russia and the United States. Ukraine was third. The United States uh, hectored Ukraine to surrender the nukes to Russia, of all places, mm. right? And uh, Ukraine's nuclear uh, industry collapsed. And in exchange, Ukraine received uh, territorial uh, uh, guarantees of, uh, of uh, or, or guarantees of national uh, security from the United States, Britain, and Russia, and then France and China signed on. Well, it's been eight years. Russia invaded, occupied, annexed Crimea. So, what country in the world again will ever sign or agree to a piece of paper relating to? nuclear arms right? yeah it's a good point look, look at a debate with iran and 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 remember these other countries like iran it's a country that wants to have a military nuclear capacity ukraine already had it and gave it up so iran doesn't have it yet why should it agree to anything that we're going to ask them to sign or that we're going to sign north korea has it you think we're going to be able to disarm north korea it ain't going to happen how on what basis? It's not going to happen. So the multiplier effect of Russia's conduct in Ukraine, and even, or I should say, as importantly, obviously, our behavior, our conduct, our stance is very, very telling. And that is where the real importance of uh, Russia's war against Ukraine is. Uh, Ukraine is used as a template for cyber warfare. We're seeing it right now. You know, tomorrow morning, you're going to open the spigot and there's no water. Why not? Russian fingerprints are all over American infrastructure, and they have been for over a decade. Yeah. Our water, our electrical grid, everything, it's there. What do we think the Colonial Pipeline was? Yeah. I mean, it said it came out that they thought Biden said the the malefactors were in Russia, but not the Russian government, which is, of course, ridiculous. But well, that's that that that's unfortunate. It, that's a huge disappointment, and, and President Biden should know better. Uh, nobody in Russia would even dare to think doing this at all on their own. It doesn't happen. No, and why would they? Yeah, for it's a yeah. bunch of kids for fun. No. Yeah, right. No, no. There, there is. There, there's not a snowball's chance in hell this wasn't bona fide, so to speak, authorized, intentional malevolence by the Kremlin, and uh, it's getting worse, and it will get worse. It will get worse until they feel pushback and they're convinced that we will stick to our guns and that we have the political will. Right now, up to now, we have not had that. We've had some sanctions, that's good. Nowhere near what should uh, be applied given the kind of violations internationally that Russia has engaged in. And, and engaged in themselves and helped the corrupt ex-president of Ukraine engage in where sure. billions of dollars were just stolen out of the country, never to be returned. I mean, it's it, it, un the, the amount of money that was taken out of Ukraine by that that Manafort uh, Manafort's client Manafort, there. Yeah, and and Man Ma Ma Manafort was uh, Ma Manafort uh, Manafort ultimately ultimately was working for Putin. Yeah, ultimately, absolutely. He put Yanukovych in power, and his contact Kilimnik. 
Uh, you know, this is a GRU contact. You know, some of the surprise speculation uh, in the press after the determination recently, the release of some documents that, uh, well, what did Kalimnik do with the information that uh, Manafort gave him? Did he really give it up to his bosses in the FSB? I am, I'm, a, I'm blown away to hear ostensibly intelligent people writing and speculating about the possibility that maybe it's something else. It, I, I, no, I've made fun of this a lot because it's not made fun of, but it's it's it blows my mind that anyone in the media didn't. When, when that news broke, I was like, didn't we know that already? Like, what did we think he did with it? Of course, he gave it to his bosses. That's, exactly. He's the he's he's the he's the FSB guy that specializes in tampering with elections. You know, that's what he does. That's he doesn't do it himself. It's it, it's crazy. So, okay, this is a good place to 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 wrap up because. I've been giving a lot of thought lately. I, I did a, a piece a couple of weeks ago where I was um, rating the presidents that we've had. Even the good ones, there's been some bad things that happened on their watch. I mean, the two, two of the three presidents that we widely regarded as the two best are FDR and Lincoln, who are also presidents doing the two bloodiest wars in US history. So the idea that you know you can't be president or the head of state, especially of a powerful country like this, historically the most powerful country that ever existed, and not have to make life and death decisions about military stuff. And nobody wants war. Nobody wants World War, like real World War III. But on the other hand, as we've discussed, there are crazy, you know, maniacal people like Putin, like the Chinese, like the North Koreans, who are looking at what we're doing. And if we're not going to establish some sort of deterrence, they're going to keep getting more and more brazen. So I look at Putin and I think, what do we do with this guy? Like, what, what should we do? That's 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 the question. Okay, if if we continue on the same path that we have been on, uh, we're gonna and and, and I, I gave this at a talk in um, November of uh, when was it, 2014 actually in uh, in Washington that. If we continue along the same trajectory, we will be faced by another Cuban Missile Crisis. But the uh, result of that, the outcome, is not going to be the way it was described at that time by the Secretary of State Dean Rusk. He said, well, we were to eyeball to eyeball and the other guy just blinked, right? Mm -hmm. That will not be the conclusion this time around. We have to answer some questions, first of all, how is it that one country like Russia, half the population of the United States, has been able to take the entirety of Western democracy and pretty much press us up, up, up against the rope? And yet they hold their own people in thrall. The same with China, the same with North Korea. There is something fundamentally wrong. And what's wrong is that these countries are playing us, taking our strengths and using them as our most vulnerable points everything that we recited before. Yes, we have to have a strong military, but that is very, I think, short-sighted, and that gives us zero options. We have to do what I've been arguing for years. We have to do what they're doing to us. We have to turn them inward by creating, not creating artificial problems, but promoting problems internally so they are deflected and they have to address internal issues. I'm not saying hacking a gas pipeline within Russia that as they have done with us with the colonial pipeline, although that's not a bad idea, right? Minimally, we have to stop the, uh, um, the North Sea 2 uh, pipeline, which is gonna be feeding tremendous amount of much, uh, uh, money to Russia. And we have to take advantage of what? As far as Russia is concerned, Russia is itself the last remaining empire. We had three concentric circles. We had Eastern Europe as part of the Soviet empire. We had the Soviet Union as an empire in and of itself. Those republics spun off that Putin is trying to reassort control over. But the so-called Russian Federation is a federation only in name. There are two dozen nations that were occupied and conquered by Russia through the centuries. And they have a right to exist. In the 19th century, the Russian general staff was given the assignment of studying the last two centuries of Russia's military campaigns. 
How do you think Russia became the largest country in the world? 36 wars, three of them were defensive. 33 were offensive. That is how Russia bloated out to be this huge blob on the map that you said as a kid you were looking at, right? Mm -hmm. That and other tensions without Russia, complaints about budgeting, economy, environmental, first and foremost, probably uh, stripping the country of its wealth, the oligarchs, advertising to the Russian people what they sense, what they know, but giving it to them in graphic demonstration of what the leaders in the Kremlin are doing. We have to take measures to turn Russia inward, to take the pressure off of us. There is no reason why they're immune. Why do we allow Putin to cross the Delaware and and walk into Congress? Why? Why do we allow that, right? How can it be that one country that doesn't manufacture, doesn't have anything to offer the world. It can't even make a better frying pan. At least China can make a frying pan, right? We don't get that from China, from uh, from Russia. All we get are natural resources, primarily oil. How does that one country manage to achieve and get what it has so far on the world stage? It's by failure and by default on our part. And we have to take a hard look at ourselves and our own psychology as much as we have to look at Putin's psychology or the psychology of people uh, in Pyongyang or in Beijing. And we have to start thinking and having a policy, not to react, not just to respond. You're not gonna go anywhere. We've been doing that for years and we're going downhill. We're starting to swirl the drain right now. Yeah, It's gonna get worse. I, I, I will tell you, it is going to get worse. Domestic terrorism, where the hell did that come from? When? Did we have it 20 years ago? You think that's all indigenous? Oh, yes, we have grievances. I understand. But we'll work out our internal problems as long as they're truly internal and not imported. But it's on the external global stage. You want a lithium battery? Where are you going to get your rare earth metals from if you can't get them outside of the United States? And you can't. Right? Our medicines, our pharmaceuticals, it's China. Okay, some is out of India. Do we realize how thin were spread and the dependency that we have on these totalitarian regimes. And we will wake up and it may be too late. I'm telling you, when you open up the spigot and there's no water, forget about no gas at the pump. There's no water and there's no heat in the dead of winter. And then how are, how are the trucks going to deliver the food to the store? You go to the store this, the, and people are going to say, how the hell did this happen? Well, there's a reason for it. We have to take a very, very hard, critical look at ourselves and we have to listen, and it's not just the Ukrainians. There are hundreds of millions of people of humanity whose representatives have been screaming and yelling and waving their uh, arms on the sidelines saying, hey, listen, listen to this. We have to listen to them. We really do. Talking about things getting worse, I mean, we had a taste of it last year, a year ago when the pandemic started and all of a sudden there was no toilet paper and there was no Formula 409 spray cleaner for the longest time. And my, it, it took months and months for some of this stuff to come back. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that pipeline thing, they fixed it, but it's scary. I mean, we, you're right. If, if, if we turn the water on and there's no water, that's, that's a, a real uh, nightmare waiting to happen. So the, 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 the answer is not, allow me to uh, this final word. The answer is not to put a bandaid on the problem. The answer is not just to shore up our defenses. You know, you, h- how many fingers do you have to put, uh, put into the dike? There's going to be <laughs> another hole. You're going to run out of fingers and toes. The thinking has to be radically changed, and we have to start looking at an affirmative, assertive policy against these totalitarian regimes. They are holding their own people captive, and yet they're able to achieve what they're achieving against us, a free society and a free country. How is that possible? Right, China's got a billion people. They're captives. Yeah. Right. And you you mean we can't take advantage of that? We can't take advantage of the fact that there is something that is prompting people to cross the Rio Grande and scale the wall and swim the river to get into this country. Those things and those values, those intangibles that those people want to have, we can't take advantage of that and use that 
in dealing with Russia and China and Iran? If we can't do that, then you know what? Maybe we don't deserve to continue. I don't know. <laughs> well, you this is a moment of weakness for Putin, too. He has he has Navalny in prison. He's got people in the streets. Sure. He's he's on shaky ground. If we're going to go after him and sow division, now's the time to do it. It's right there for the taking. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me. This was fantastic. I'm so glad that we got to that this uh happen because as i said i've been looking forward to it for a while now thanks for joining me sure absolutely thank you very much appreciate it have a good night the prevail theme song is by matthew fossa sophia tereshenko provided the russian introduction voice talent and i do mean talent is provided by tally briggs signa della stephanie st john and ryan byrne at history falls apart thanks to allison gill mackenzie mazell kanai williams and everyone else at msw media Please subscribe to the Prevail website with updates every Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday. Visit gregoliar.com. That's G-R-E-G-O-L-E-A-R.com. I'm grateful for your generous support. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with a friend. Thanks for listening. Drive safely. And don't forget to tip your server. Until next time, we shall prevail. <laughs>